Welcome more gamers, Doug here from 2 Plus Tough. And in this video, we're gonna break down how to get started playing Conquest, The Last Argument of Kings. We're going to look at the various factions that might entice you, which one you wanna jo join into is, is really your first pivotal decision. Then we're gonna talk about how to build into any one of the armies, because they have some fantastic deals for getting started. And then talk about the other stuff, podcasts, community, all that kind of stuff. So if you're looking to get into Conquest, Last Argument of Kings, you came to the right place. I will say here in the beginning, if you are looking Looking to get into the game or expand what you already own I do have a discount code in the description down below using that goes a long way to supporting the channel and it saves you 10% on all of your purchases thank you so much to everyone who has used it already it's life-changing stuff and it means the absolute world but if you just heard the new announcement of the the new edition 2.0 dropped uh, yesterday at this point and you're like okay well this sounds intriguing what are the different factions and stuff that's what we're going to start off with there are seven armies going into second edition and uh, we're going to kind of give you a bullet point for each of them some just some basic concepts the rules and stuff will change at the time of recording the army lists for 2.0 are not quite out yet they come uh, in two to three days so we're going to give you like a faction taster from a sense of what are they trying to represent because that won't change, right? The minutia of the rules and the points always will because that's game balance. But if you don't like how the army functions from a core design point, you're not going to like it no matter what. And so for starting conquest, the first thing you can do is pick your army. As I said, there are seven. There's the Old Dominion, Dweg, Home, Wadroon, City States, which uh, there's an asterisk next to that one, uh, the Hundred Kingdoms, Nord, and Spires. Each one of them has a ton of different options available. Generally speaking, they can all be played rather elite. They can all be played heavy infantry, uh, beast or cavalry, depending, because like Nords don't have cavalry, but they have these huge wolves that kind of fill the same niche, those kinds of things. So all the factions have access to quite a few variations, but in this video, we're gonna touch what makes them unique. Like what, what are they all good at? I'm just be throwing up a whole bunch of pictures here of the various factions as we go through them, just to give you a sense of the model lines, because to me, when it comes to a miniatures game, if you're not sold on the models, everything else becomes a slog. So finding a combination of things that look cool to you and that kind of call out to your particular play style are both important. So let's start with the 100 Kingdoms. This is the baseline humans of the setting and their big thing is they have tons of infantry and some of the best cavalry options in the game. In fact, I'm gonna go on and say the best cavalry options and certainly in terms of variety as well. They are a combined arms, you know, jack of all trades, master of nothing kind of a faction. They, they don't have a lot of artillery or long range shooting, but longbowmen are terrific and have only gotten better in the new edition with the changes to rules for uh, clarifying line of sight as well as like uh, obscuring penalties for distance. You're going to be looking at a lot of dudes to run up the board and try and hold the line while your heavy hitters, meaning your cavalry, your bowmen, uh, leaders who you've decked out with all kinds of weapons or spells can come in for the finishing blow. If you're looking for something that is reminiscent of true fan I mean I guess sort of historical wargaming this is kind of what you're looking at because the various types of regiments all do exactly what you expect them to do right uh, militia peasants very lightly armored they die in droves but they exist for a very good reason they're the cheapest way to hold you know table space and project threat and stuff like that they have some of the best wizard spells in the game in my opinion i love their spellcasters the uh, chapter mage is a wonderful model and i just she has a great utility spell set tons of officers tons of upgrades what that means for you practically speaking though is that if you buy a regiment let's say men at arms that's like your basic you know objective holder type unit they're mediums they can cap objectives in the game and they have shields so they're just there to kind of like withstand whatever they can well you can actually take that unit if you put a hero in it and give it some officers it'll add a whole bunch of universal special rules to the regiment now it can start to do things it could be a delivery system to bring your absolute meat grinder of a noble lord into combat it could be something as simple as dramatically increasing their defensiveness to sit on an objective the point is you're looking for ways to take your average humans to extraordinary levels with great use of flanking by your extremely fast mobile cavalry you can envelop your opponent and, and just crush them. The next faction to talk about are the Spires. Now the Spires are very interesting. They don't fit most uh, fantasy archetypes. If you had to explain them as something from say Fantasy Battles, uh, which is another rank and flank game that was you know, very widely well known, uh, I would say they're kind of a mix of elves and vampire counts, kind of a strange thing. Elves in the sense that they are a very aloof, 
very um, powerful when it comes to, not magic, because thematically they don't have magic, but they're equivalent to it. Their special effects, their universal special roles are terrific. And the way that they do stuff in terms of vampire countiness is they make these little like drones that have no sentience. They're just basically flesh automatons and just have them move as major armies. These are like the, the big rank and flank guys you get in the starter set. Those are force grown drones. And those are like your rank and file guys. Totally expendable. They have a bunch of cool abilities where you can like hurt your own units, but make them fight better. So all of a sudden this dirt cheap, nothing nobody is swinging like he's a champion boxer. He gets hurt at the end of the round, but with that you can get your your chumps essentially to swing way above their weight class and then you can heal them back as an added bonus. The Spires also have one of the coolest monsters in the game, that is the Abomination. It's not my favorite model, I'll be honest with you, but rules-wise, this sucker is amazing. It's heavy, so it comes in later and a lot of people are like, well, I don't want it to, I don't want to pay points for something that's not on the board the whole game, but this thing is so stinking fast, it just rushes up the board and can get wherever you need it to be. Now, they don't just have a whole bunch of nobodies who die to a stiff breeze. There are uh, a number of great elite choices for the Spire. Specifically, uh, the Lineage Highborn is a hero who can take Avatara, which is essentially the Spires themselves, the very few, the noble, the proud, project their minds and consciousness into these huge towering constructs, and those are like living blenders that fall in behind all the various chumps that are meant to be sacrificed. When you're talking about Spire, you really have to have an idea of what your units can do. I would highly suggest you get tokens to keep track of the stacking effects, but if you learn how to do those, like I said, you can take a crappy unit and swing way above what your opponent is anticipating from. If you're doing like a concentrated flank kind of strategy where you really lean heavily to one side of the board, maybe on the other sides, you know, to have a few guys withstand a whole deal as if they were more, you can buff them up. They get hurt a little bit, but they can hold the flank while the main army's on the side doing the real damage. Next up are the Nords, and this is the army I'm going to be building in 2023. I got into the game with Dweg Home because I liked the simplicity of their rules. We'll get to them in a second. But Nords really began to call to me because of their play style. I play Orcs in Age of Sigmar, which is just rushing forward. It's a lot of aggression, and then you think about the objective play. That is kind of how I play all armies in any war game that I'm in and so it's no different here. I'm excited to jump into the Nords for that reason. They are the I guess typical glass cannon army. Not a ton of defense. Uh, evade which is sort of like a super save. Uh, there's like a, a few, couple units that have that but not enough that I would want to like lean heavily on it. They have some wonderful heroes that can be very killy in combat but the truth is their strength comes from their ability to project threat super far forward. They can just run across the board very, very quickly. They have units that um, get better as they get hurt. So as they take wounds, they gain access to special rules, which is kind of their, their thing. The idea is as you're seeing your friends die, you fight harder. But the reason that I was really drawn to them is the model variety. There is infantry, of course, which all look fantastic and stunning as Parabellum is wont to do, but they also have like beast packs and eventually there's gonna be a unit of bears you can take, something like that. Uh, they have all these weird monsters and creations because their backstory is that they were genetically experimented upon by the Spire, and so what they call, you know, beasts of myth and legend are actually just kind of tinkering rejects from the experiments of a different faction. But they have everything from, you know, obviously infantry, a few different kinds of heroes, because there are different kinds of heroes, it's important to remember. Uh, some that are magic-based, some combat, some that are huge and they fit on brute size bases, and some that are really small. They're all over the place, they have a little bit of everything, but it is all centered around aggression. Pure forward aggression. Next up are the Dweg Home. These are the angry dwarves of the setting. Uh, this is the current army that I play and I love right now. They are incredibly fun to paint. The details on them are stunning and they're very easy to get into because all of their baseline units that come in the starter set are stunning choices. Ballista and Hold Warriors have both done fantastic for me. The real thing that the Dweg Home have going for them is they're, they're kind of like a, a next step up from the Hundred Kingdoms if you specifically wanted to focus on um, combined arms. That is to say, the Hundred Kingdoms have access to a lot of different kinds of troops that all do different things, but the Dweg Home 
rather than that have a few different archetypes there's defensive things a lot of shooting if you are looking for a shooting army these guys have the magma cannons the fire forged are one of the coolest models ever i get compliments whenever i bust mine out big magma cannons on their shoulder it makes them look like they're in terminator armor uh i think this is the route that gw should have gone for their 40k dwarves or whatever but that's just my opinion i love these guys their drawbacks are incredibly low speeds there's not a lot of like high movement stats period but then also in addition to that their special abilities masteries artifacts other factions have ways of kind of modifying the reinforcement role to get troops on the field faster the dweg home really don't they don't have a lot of access to those things they are meant to be slow but this kind of inexorable advance that moves up the board towards objectives where you have strong defensive units that are magnified by the leaders that are in them. I mean, there are some super defensive and killy leaders in this faction, but those are being supported by things like the Hellbringer Drake and the Fireforged and the Ballista and things that can just douse immense amounts of armor piercing fire upon their opponents. The speed is a problem. Like, I mean, the last edition, I just played it on an event on Saturday. It, it is a, their hindrance to overcome. You have to be very intentional about where you set your units on the board and exactly where they're going. There's no wiggle room to be able to like, oh, I put this guy out of position. Nope. If you get hit from the flank, these guys, they die real hard and their shooting units want to be shooting every single round. That said, they're incredibly interesting because one, their aesthetic is awesome. Two, they have a, a whole bunch of spells for their tempered sorcerers that are devastating to their enemies. And the tempered steel shapers have debuff spells for their opponents. And with those things combined, it's essentially bringing people down to your level so that your average warrior can stand up to them and not get hit too badly on the on the receiving end of the punch. But then also, they're blocking the way for your big, big guns to fire over the front line. The next faction are the Wadroon. These are sort of the orcs of the setting. They are essentially artificial beings. They were fully created uh, after the spires got done of tinkering with the Nords. They were like, actually, let's just start from scratch and made their own thing. And that is what we call the Wadroon. They have a very unique mechanic. Essentially, every time you activate a regiment, they are changing chanting okay so they you put a counter on whatever type of unit they are whether they're chanting for death or chanting for famine there's all different kinds of things you can chant for i'm not going to go into super detail but what it means is is that at certain intervals like every third unit for example when the chants hit a certain point or a threshold they can use that bonus and all of a sudden they swing above their weight class so this is a, a, a army that has some incredibly cool looking models and if you want to maximize what they do on the table like the best woodroom players are ones who can time the chance to coincide with very powerful units activating and things and messing them up it is sort of akin to if you're familiar with anything warhammer the idea that orcs have like a wah they all scream together instead of being a once per game thing like games workshop tends to do with anything orcish uh this is much more of a slow burn it's they're getting more you know it fervored the more they activate the more they run towards battle and so that has more of an ongoing buff rather than a once per game thing it's definitely one of their newer lines so they don't have quite as many unit options but the ones that they do have are incredible warbred are fantastic brute units they can just hit like a mac truck the apex predator is one of the coolest models that has been produced for any miniature game i don't care what what you say raptor riders again very very fast they don't hit too terribly hard when they're not on the charge but they can whip around and get you on the flank with an extra uh what is it, like quick formation or something like that like reform on the side and just hit you directly from the flank and just mess you all up they are this interesting combination of speed glass canyoniness but with the way the faction works overall with the chance much more so than Nords, this one is about maximizing those benefits. Whatever that you want to call your, whatever cult your faction is leaning towards, whether it's death, famine, war, or something else, all those things, pick one, lean into it real hard, and your guys can do much, much better than they do on paper. In a similar boat, in terms of model, you know, diversity, I guess, is the Old Dominion, a faction that came out immediately after we drew, and they're kind of tied for releases at this point. Uh, essentially, the Old Dominion is the premier death faction of Parabellum's world. Essentially, the god of mankind went crazy, he merged with the god of death, and all of his followers became these things. It's like Dark Souls puked into fantasy battles, and this is the mix. I think these guys are awesome. At the event I saw, I played Old Dominion twice, so I am now very well educated in their rules. That was my cat. Ignore him. But the Old Dominion are very interesting. I feel like every miniatures game has an army like this, where they don't observe all of the core rules. For example, 
the Old Dominion, they cannot inspire, meaning when they go into Clash uh, and fight people, they get it on the charge, but they can't take an inspire action to raise their Clash value. So once they get stuck in, they're stuck. Now that being said, when you, uh, they also don't have a resolve, so they're immune to combat attrition through Battle Shock, essentially. Again, another huge buff that they're ignoring part of the game for. But where things start to fall apart for them is when it comes to their commands. If you can get their heroes, they're done. I mean, these guys evaporate pretty good. Some of the heroes are, are pretty tanky. They can be. All in all, I had no problem deleting units. It was more that they can restore models faster than I, as a Dweg home player, could physically move my regiments up the board to get there to them. I had great games for both Old Dominions. I won one, lost one uh, when I was playing against them. And to me, the defining thing that I saw quite a bit was regeneration. And then as you, as an Old Dominion player, have your stands die, you keep count of those and you get more bonuses the more things die. So as your army gets smaller, the units remaining get much, much better. So rather than being the spires, like the typical vampire count thing where you cast spells and effects to, you know, make your chumps swing above their weight class, that's going to naturally happen. So now you can start to see how, like, pacing the different waves of your army, having regiments that are there specifically to die, just to die, that's it, just to cork up, you know, charge lanes and stuff and die to give you those stand bonuses to increase your, your, your death level or whatever, to make everything else more efficient is a totally viable strategy. They have fantastic fantastic spells, uh, lots of debuffs to the opponent. Uh, there's a one guy, and I'll try to find a picture of him, he's holding a, uh, a, a coffin with him, and this means that other factions attacking his regiment cannot inspire. So you basically share the pain that you have to feel with everybody else, and that is the most upsetting thing ever, and I, I loved it. I respected it so much as a piece. Uh, at the same time, cursing its very existence as a Dweg home player. The models are stunning, and again, the only thing they suffer from, along with the Wadroon, is that they are the newest factions and therefore don't have as many official models out. But you can proxy a lot of things, and there is enough, like, like I said, I played them twice. I didn't play the same list twice. There is now enough archetypes within Old Dominion to play very different things, just like there are with, with uh, Wadroon as well. So it's not as much of a hindrance, but there are going to be a lot more options to you available in the future. And our last entry here is the newest when the city-states. Now, I will be clear, at the time of recording, their uh, rules have not officially dropped. I'm doing playtesting for them. I'm not going to talk about the actual rules of the faction, but I can share with you what Parabellum has already shared as kind of their design idea. The city-states are really meant to be another human faction that is fundamentally different from the Hundred Kingdoms in the kinds of units it can take and the kind of lists it can take. Here's what I mean. These guys have things like minotaurs, like monsters. They also have homunculus and colossus, you know, giant metal statues that they've animated with their magic. So a lot more fantastical stuff than the Hundred Kingdoms, which is much more like um, medieval as we know it. This is where you get into the weird stuff. They have a Greek hoplite theme and their unique shtick, if you will, is being able to splash different uh, stands into each other. What I mean is, if you're familiar with like Death Watch from uh, 40K where you have a unit and then you can add a guy on a motorcycle and that gives the whole unit this special rule kind of a thing. It's the same concept here, where you can have a unit of hop hoplites and add a minotaur, and now the minotaur stand adds rules for the unit. Or when you charge, the minotaur gets to do extra stuff, attacking as a minotaur rather than the other guys. It, it's not quite um, the same thing as like having dogs of war where you can intermix units on a grand scale. This is much more contained than that because it's all within one faction, but it does open up a whole lot of design possibilities. So if you're someone who likes the minutia of tinkering and, and moving these special rules to this unit to see what it can do, I think that you're gonna like city-states. So from those seven, pick which one resonates with you the most, both in terms of models and, and rules and stuff. For the purposes of me walking through this with you, I'm gonna go ahead and say Nords. That's what I wanna do for 2023. So now that we've chosen our faction, let's head over to the Parabellum store. There's a link in my description below. Like I said before, that's an affiliate link. I'd appreciate it if you use it, but you don't have to. Here we are, and we're gonna look at the various faction that you chose, and we can also clarify what we're looking for here by special offers, start here, and so on. The start here is nice because it gives 
gives us a running list of all of the faction starters. Unfortunately, this does it for Conquest as well as First Blood, their skirmish version. Ignore most of this stuff. We're going to skip all the way to the back and start cracking into the actual one player and two player starter sets. Now, unless otherwise stated, the best way to get into any faction in this game is to get that faction's one player starter set. The only exception to that is Hunter Kingdoms and Spires both have incredible uh, two player starter set values. And there is also a two player starter set for city states. As of right now, the only place to get those and uh, the Nords. Every single one of these starter sets is going to give you somewhere in the vicinity of uh, like six to eight hundred points uh, of, of an army, generally coming with one hero and up to four regiments. For all of them that I can recall, at least all of the single player ones, the four regiments you get tend to be two copies of two multi kits, meaning um, you get two boxes of blank that can be built either as option A or option B, and two options of you know box C that can be built as x and y the reason that this is important and makes them a great place to start is that the infantry choices that come in those box sets generally speaking uh, are the best ways to start an army because they have a lot of the mainstay or the common units that you're going to use for example dweg home they can build hold warriors or hold ballista any hero in their entire army can take those two regiments you will never feel like you're wasting your money on that especially in the beginning now if you're buying a, a huge lot and someone's offering you like you know 50 stands of them, maybe you don't need that many, but it, it's a great baseline to start building from. The same goes for all of them. You get a little bit less when it comes to the two player sets, but to make up for that, you're also getting like the rule books and a bunch of other stuff. There's tons of printed material and objectives and things in there. There's a lot. Nords being an exception that proves the rule, of course, now that I'm wrong about it. Uh, you get two boxes of raiders, which are essentially these little tiny light guys up at the top, a Jarl to lead them, the more elite infantry of the Huskarls, as well as a unit of Ogre, which can be taken by the Jarl. One thing that I will say, regardless of, of what you build your units as or what faction you're taking, I can say confidently every single one of these boxes makes a complete warband. Meaning, if you buy this, you can play this. Yeah, I can have a Jarl that has two regiments of raiders, a thing of Huskarls, and a thing of ogres. There's never going to be a box that comes out and you're like, I literally cannot run this thing. I don't know if you guys have seen like some of those sets from GW. Like you buy it and you're like, yeah, but now you have to buy two other things to make your battle line options and fill out the ranks. And you're like, well, that's crummy. I kind of wanted to just buy a thing. Here you go. Now, the way that I personally approach army construction, or I should say army collection, because you want to start building a collection to have options to do various things, is to start with your basics, which the starter boxes generally do, so whatever your baseline infantry is. From there, I would probably say look at the models for regiments that you really want to take. Whether it's a hero, or in my case, I love trolls. I love, love, love the way Parabellum does their trolls. I want to play them. So I'm going to start there and reverse engineer how to get a bunch of trolls. And in this case, I'm going to take a blooded hero and then a bunch of other options to make them function. But that's where I'm going with it. What I would say to you is once you've chosen the faction, grab their starter because it's always a good choice just to have those kind of general troops as a baseline. And then start picking the stuff that you're most excited about and build around that. At least that's how I approach it. I mean, from a perspective of trying to balance getting into a, a game that has a lot of moving parts, but also focusing on the things that bring me personal joy and make me want to paint. But now that you got some models from your chosen faction, we're going to go ahead and talk rules. All the rules for Conquest and their subsequent armies are totally free online. You don't have to spend a single thing. You don't have to create an account. You don't have to do any of that. They're free online PDFs. If you're on the main site, you just go to rules and FAQ at the top there. Um, these are the different game systems they have. Argument of Kings is the full rank and flank game. First Blood is their skirmish version. And then anything extras, they have PDFs that go along with, um, like for example, their campaign docs are going to be here. Core rules, obviously, are on the core rules section. Go figure. Uh, it's it's going to be the Last Argument of Kings core rules version 2.0. This just dropped. There's also a quick start guide if you're giving demos. These are wonderful to print off as they do walk through most of the sequences of the game in a very clear and concise way. Um, army lists, they have not been updated here. But this is where they will be. You'll see a whole collection of different armies. They usually have them in different languages, uh, some printer-friendly versions, things like that, and that's very helpful. And errata, this is simply meant to be if there's a rule that like they're trying to give the perspective from the designer, this is where it would go. There's not a ton of these here because they just updated everything, but this is where you would find it all. Also, from that main page, you might see there is an army builder, and I have just talked about this and doted on it for a while. There will be a 2.0 army builder that goes up 
along with the factions. We've been testing that as well. I've actually been testing the list builder app more than I have the actual core rules of the game, to be honest with you, because to me, this is this is where rubber meets the road for new players, right? Getting them hooked, where you can look at the various things. You have browse factions. You can look at the rules for everything to see if what you like, if you're more of a rules person. And prepare for war is where you get to turn these into actual lists. For a point of reference, the list builder starts at 2K, and that's the event that I went to on Saturday. But to be perfectly honest, I see 1,500 points being a very popular popular size as well. It's very accessible. It means each warband is roughly 500 points unless you want to really stretch one and make it much bigger. And uh, to me, it's a very accessible point level for most people starting games. So if you're a local Vanguard or you want to start playing, I think 1500 points is a wonderful place to do that. They're not like Games Workshop where they have bespoke point levels. You can really do whatever you want. It's just a lot of gamers are trained at 2000 because that's what we've known for so long. So feel free to experiment. Like I said, I prefer 1500. So with your models, your rules, you're all set to play. Let's talk about getting actually connected into all of this. Now, once you have everything and if you have any questions, I highly recommend your first stop is joining the Parabellum Discord. It is exceptionally well moderated. There's very helpful people. Uh, there's lots of vanguards, which are volunteer leaders like me, and uh, we're more than happy to have more than happy, more than happy to help out with any questions that you have. They have a great process for rewarding engagement, a, a very awesome way of having an ongoing lore section with their living world system where players get to participate and create craft the narrative of the setting and i you know i've never seen in the year and a half i've been on their discord i've never seen anybody like be made to feel stupid for asking what is otherwise an obvious question i ask them sometimes because sometimes stuff just falls out of your head uh everything from complex questions to simple ones everyone's there to help and show off their painting and, and just really be an encouragement to one another also a lot of the staff just kind of hangs out in their Discord. So if you just want to hang out with a game designer in Greece, you can do that probably. Beyond that, there is a Facebook group called Conquest the First Argument of Kings, which I, I also participate in whenever I can, uh, if you're more of a Facebook person. And from there, it really it's about your local group. If you're looking for information about Conquest in terms of like podcasts and stuff like that, uh, Vanguard Garage Gaming, is, VGG, is a podcast held out of Australia. It's really the premier podcast for conquest at this point um one of the guys who hosted that eventually became an employee of parabellum but he still is allowed to do his show which is wonderful i love when companies let their employees have side things to just get excited but yeah i'm i'm absolutely stoked that that podcast has been immensely helpful for me because that there's a two hosts and they kind of go back and forth and together they do a great job of breaking down the synergies for example there's an episode where they explain how dwegholm the dwarves that go real slow can increase their speed and they walk you through the different synergy levels and what that means to your entire faction it was exceptionally helpful to me and i think it will be for you too they're awesome guys beyond that there's me here on youtube i do uh conquest lore videos and i'm going to start doing a set of tacticals and uh you know, product reviews, things like that. 2023 is going to be a big year for Conquest for me because it's where I'm finding most of my hobby enjoyment, right? As other channels pop up and, and they show consistency and full slate appropriateness uh, based on what I like to share, uh, I will leave those in the comments down below. So that'll be an ongoing thing. Go check that. But I mean, that's it, man. You guys are locked. You've researched the various factions. You got some models. You got your rules. Uh, you hopefully have an opponent to play against. I would love that. Uh, if not, you can start being a vanguard. It doesn't really require much they just want to support people getting out there and creating hobby spaces for their properties and uh, they're just a great company to work with hope you enjoyed my little faction breakdowns or synopsis uh, leave your thoughts in the comments down below and if you are someone who plays a faction and you disagree with my again hyper synopsis without going into anything rules specific uh, leave in the comments down below i always pin the most helpful comments so as long as you're nice about it you can help out <laughs> big shout out to parabellum for just their support of me and the channel and everything i'm doing here i appreciate it and i would love to see more folks get into this game with me y'all stay safe and i'll catch you next time happy wargaming